Hello and welcome back everyone, I'm Jason, and today I'd like to talk about cause and effect in our universe, right? The big picture cause and effect in our universe. Today, we're fluttering into a concept that I've been personally interested in for a long time, and that is the so-called butterfly effect. Now, you probably heard the phrase before that a butterfly is flying around, flapping its wings someplace far, far away, like Brazil or something like this. And somehow, through that action, it causes a tornado to form someplace far away, like Texas. Now, is this just a poetic way of saying that everything's kind of interconnected on our planet, or is there real science behind it? In other words, is that sort of thing really actually possible, or is it just something that's kind of neat to talk about? Today, I like to chat about the butterfly effect and take a tour through various fields called chaos theory, uh, talking about weather patterns and the delicate balance of cause and effect. And I'd also like to give a couple of real life examples of what you might consider to be the butterfly effect. Now first, let's start off with the basics. What exactly is the butterfly effect anyway? At its core, the butterfly effect is a concept in a branch of mathematics called chaos theory. You're gonna hear that a lot during this. And that this part of chaos theory suggests that small changes in the initial conditions of a process or a system can lead to large scale unpredictable consequences. It's sort of like the idea that the tiny, seemingly insignificant events can set off a chain reaction that grow and grow and grow and end up producing massive changes down the line. Now this whole thing is based on what I just mentioned, something called chaos theory. So I'd like to touch on chaos theory in a little bit of detail at the big picture level. Now it's the mathematical framework that gives us concepts like the butterfly effect. Now, chaos theory itself is a branch of math, mentioned that before, and it studies complex systems. And that just means that the behavior of the system is highly sensitive to very small and slight changes in conditions, specifically initial conditions of the system. I'll talk about that a lot more in just a second. In other words, it deals with systems where small alterations can trigger vastly different outcomes. And this makes the long-term predictions of these systems' behavior nearly impossible, even though they are what we actually call deterministic, which means that their future states are determined by their initial conditions. Now we have to stop and just talk for a second or nothing will make sense, right? We have this concept in physics called determinism. What it means is if you have a baseball, right, and you throw the baseball, if you know the initial angle that you throw the ball, like exactly, and you know the initial velocity that you throw the ball, and I mean exactly, and you know the height above the ground, you know the force of gravity, as best as you can actually know all of these things, then what we can do is we can write an equation down what predicts the position and the velocity of that ball as it flies through the air with great precision. Now, if you dive into it too deep, okay, eventually you get to atoms and you get to the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics where nothing's really ever certain, okay? I'm not talking about quantum systems. Let's talk about baseballs and things like butterflies, bigger systems like that, right? So this baseball, when you throw it, is what we call deterministic. That was actually a really big deal when that sort of thing was discovered that you can write down equations that will predict what happens in the future. So in theory, if you have a system and you know everything about what we call the initial conditions, in this case, the initial conditions of the ball is the angle, the speed, the height, gravity, is there any air, like everything you would need to know about that planet, then you could predict exactly where it will be, all right? But we have these systems and these things called differential equations, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, that contain as inputs to the calculation the initial conditions. Now, if I change the angle of the ball, a little bit, then the downrange position will be different of the ball. Obviously, you expect that. But sometimes systems behave in a way where a tiny change in the input, like if you change the angle by 0.001 degree, then the downrange velocity and the speed of the ball is changed, but also very, very small, because the initial condition just changed just a tiny, tiny bit but the downrange final position velocity also changed a tiny, tiny bit. Now in this chaos theory, it is the study of systems that don't behave like that. Theoretically, they're deterministic like the baseball, like you would know exactly, you could calculate where things were, but they're very sensitive to these initial conditions. And you also need to think about initial conditions not being like the trajectory of a ball, think about the initial conditions being maybe the temperature in a room or you know, something else, the momentum of whatever it is you're studying, the electric field in the room, whatever it is you're studying. And whatever it is you're studying can sometimes have very, very, very 
massive changes in the output with, with very, very small changes to those initial conditions. For instance, if I'm studying a system where I change the temperature 0.01 degrees, but it vastly changes the output, then we would say that that's sort of like a nonlinear situation. We change the temperature a tiny bit, and then the output, the final uh, position, velocity, state of the system is vastly different. That's a chaotic system. So even though it is technically deterministic, because the sensitivity to the initial condition is so great, in practice it's really hard to calculate what will actually happen. And as we're going to get to in a second, that's why predicting the weather is so hard. There's so many particles, so many atoms, so many pockets of different temperature and pressure that not only can we not know the state of everything in the beginning anyway, but the sensitivity to the vast weather patterns is very, very greatly dependent on tiny changes in those initial conditions. So when you study physics, you, you look at balls moving and things seem like they're well behaved, but in chaos theory, everything is greatly dependent on these initial conditions. And so unexpected outcomes can then come about. Now I mentioned that the math used in this chaos theory, and thus the butterfly effect, it involves what we call differential equations. Now differential equations are just like equations that you learned in regular old algebra class, except they involve calculus. So the equations, they don't just contain the variables x and y, or whatever it is you're studying, temperature, they also contain what we call the rate of change of those variables, what we call the derivative in calculus. And so these kinds of equations describe how a system changes over time, and they pop up everywhere in science, math, and engineering. The main thing that differentiates them from a regular equation is they don't just involve the variable you're studying, they involve how that variable is changing. Now there's something related here called dynamical systems theory. This is also a part of the butterfly effect, and it studies the long-term behavior of these systems, which often have high sensitivity to these initial conditions. Fractal geometry also plays a big role here because many chaotic systems produce fractal patterns. And these are patterns that are complex and never-ending designs that are also self-recursive and self-similar at different scales. Fractals themselves, all by themselves, are quite interesting and beautiful, and that will have to be another video for another day. Now one key mathematical concept you might hear about or read about when you talk about chaos theory and the butterfly effect is called the Lyapunov exponent and it measures the rate at which two initially close trajectories in a system diverge from each other. A positive Lyapunov exponent is a signature of chaos. So you might be wondering, what is the point of studying something so unpredictable? Well, chaos theory has a wide range of actual applications practical in everyday life. The biggest one that you're familiar with on everyday situations is probably forecasting the weather, like I just talked about. So it helps us understand the limits of weather prediction, and it can improve short-term forecasts if you understand chaos theory better. Also, if you ever study the financial markets, maybe the stock market, it's used to model the market volatility and the risk in an investment. In terms of biology, understanding chaos theory can aid in understanding population dynamics and the spread of bacteria and epidemics. And in physics, it's applied to fluid dynamics, quantum mechanics, and even studying the stability of the solar system. In the realm of engineering, if uh, building things floats your boat, it can help control chaotic systems or understand chaotic systems. For instance, flying an aircraft. Of course, aircraft, you want to be stable. You don't want them to pitch up. You don't want them to pitch down. You don't want them to wildly vibrate side to side, right? So depending on the design of the aircraft, understanding chaotic airflow around a wing, for instance, really goes in to building a better airplane. Now here is the big picture punchline. The butterfly effect is not about randomness per se, which is sort of how it's portrayed. It's rather about the unpredictability that can arise in a complex deterministic system and understanding how unpredictable the system might actually be. When you think about it, everything around you in the room is connected in some form or fashion, right? Because even if you're not touching something, you have air, which is a fluid between you and it. So a movement of my hand here is going to put a wave, a pressure wave in the air, which then will travel around the room and impact everything there. But even if you suck out all of the air in the room, we're still connected because there's electromagnetic radiation, there's electric fields, there's magnetic fields permeating this room and interacting with everything in it. And particles are constantly flying off and bouncing off and all kinds of other radioactive processes. Everything is interconnected, right? 
So the question is, how much does that interconnectedness affect big picture things that we would like to study, like like, air, like building airplanes or building better rockets, things like that. And how can understanding these chaotic systems, how can it help us build things that are more stable? I did one project back in school. I was a, a undergraduate in electrical engineering at the time. And we take a class called control systems theory. It's all about, it's not really chaos theory so much, but it's, it's just trying to build stable systems that are well behaved, that they don't kind of go out of control. That's why it's called control systems. And we built this uh, system where you have one knob and as you turn the knob, a signal goes through a uh, apparatus that we built, an electronic apparatus, and then it goes to a motor, which is then the motor is turning another wheel. So as you turn one knob, it goes through this apparatus and then the motor on the other end turns a wheel. Now, if you have the system, what we call well behaved or stable, then as you turn the knob, like very slowly, then it goes through to the motor and then again, through a bunch of circuitry that's in the way. And then the, uh, the wheel on the other side will turn in lockstep with it. But depending on how you design the control system, if you design it poorly, for instance, if you turn the input knob very fast, then what happens is the signal can't get over to the outside fast enough to turn the wheel. And so it lags. So if you turn it kind of a little bit too fast, then it, it kind of tries to keep up, but it can't because it's got so much electronics in the way, which are in the scope of the class, you learn how to design those things. But it's difficult to be in lockstep with that knob. And if you turn the knob wildly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, then the system is just completely unable to, uh, to, to keep up with it, right? So that's control systems theory. It's similar to chaos theory, right? You're talking about how one thing influences something else. Now, here's the thing. Why do you care about a knob like this? Well, if you think about a rocket or even an airplane, uh, if you think about a rocket engine, it has to swivel to steer the rocket. The engines at the bottom of the rocket actually sw swivel and steer to point the rocket in a new direction. Or in an airplane, the flaps, the ailerons, they have to move. And they have to be in some sort of well-defined control system so that it doesn't flutter and go out of control, right? So it's kind of an analogy more than anything because that's like an engineering thing, but it's similar sort of ideas in both cases. Now let's break it down just a little bit more so you can really get a handle on it. What we call a deterministic system is one where future events are determined entirely by previously existing causes. That's how we think our universe works, right? So in theory, if you know all of the variables of whatever you're studying, pressure, temperature, everything, and all of their exact states, you could reliably predict exactly what would happen next using equations. So this is like calculating the trajectory of the baseball that I talked about a few minutes ago. However, in complex systems like weather or other ecosystems, there are just so many variables interacting in what we call often nonlinear ways, which means the input condition changing affects the output wildly more or wildly less, that it becomes practically impossible to actually account for everything. So you can't write an equation down, and even if you could, you couldn't solve it exactly. And so by nonlinear, a tiny input may maybe make a huge swing in the output. Those are the systems we're talking about here. Now, this is when the sensitivity to these initial conditions comes into play. It's the hallmark of the butterfly effect. Even the tiniest change in the starting conditions can lead to, in these systems, wildly different values over time. It's not that the processes are really like random. It's rather that they're just so complex and sensitive that they appear random to us. So here's the main question that we started off by asking. Can a single event, like a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere in Brazil, really affect something major with a realistic probability? The short answer is theoretically yes, sort of like in quantum mechanics, you can calculate all kinds of crazy things uh, that could happen, but it's not quite as straightforward, and generally it's a very low probability of something very drastic happening as a result, but it depends on the system. The long answer requires us to talk again about chaotic systems, like the Earth's atmosphere. These tiny changes can be amplified over time. However, it's not a direct linear relationship. It's often nonlinear. If you remember back from math, nonlinear might be like an exponential function, something that grows very, very rapidly, something like that. So when we talk about this butterfly effect, it's a little more accurate to say that the flapping of the butterfly's wings changes the initial conditions of this incredibly complex system, the atmosphere. And this change propagates through the atmosphere, interacting with countless other factors that we cannot know ahead of time, 
that could potentially lead to significant differences in weather over time. However, it's important to note that the butterfly isn't really like causing directly this tornado to happen someplace far away in Texas. Rather, its actions are just part of an incredibly complicated system that's interconnected where every little thing, very, very slight changes to the initial conditions affect everything else. So now what I'd like to do is look at some real life examples of what you kind of could call the butterfly effect sort of where a small change in something led to a very, very significant output or change in the downstream results somewhere. And one fascinating example of this comes from the world of paleontology. So we have what we call what's known as the Great Dying. It's about 250 million years ago, a massive volcanic eruption in Siberia actually triggered a cascade of events that ultimately led to the extinction of something around 95% of marine species and something around 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species. Now, this initial eruption, what it did is it released a lot of greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases went into the atmosphere, went around the planet, and they warmed the planet up gradually and slowly over time. And this warming, in turn, caused the oceans to lose oxygen through a chemical process. And that led to the proliferation of anaerobic bacteria in the ocean that produced toxic hydrogen sulfide. This is a complex chain of events, right? And each step was kind of amplifying the effects of the last step. So it's sort of like an example of how one event, even though it's a big volcano, it's a tiny part of the earth, that it can cascade and amplify and have huge consequences down the road. Let's talk a little bit about technology. So we have the story of how a tiny programming error led to a massive electrical blackout. So in 2003, a software bug in an alarm system at First Energy Corporation in Ohio caused an operator to miss an important warning. Now this led to a cascading failure. Again, it's this cascading effect, right? That ultimately cut power to 55 million people across North America, specifically the United States and Canada, by a small coding mistake. It was basically amplified because of the interconnected nature of the systems. And finally, I'd like to leave you with an interesting story of how the term butterfly effect was coined in the first place. And it was sort of coined by a meteorologist named Edward Lorenz. So in 1961, Edward Lorenz, he was making a really neat discovery uh, using and talking about meteorology. He was running weather simulations on his computer, really primitive computer at the time, and he decided to repeat one simulation of the weather that he was studying with rounded numbers as inputs instead of the full precision. Presumably he was doing this because it was taking too long to calculate it with all the decimal points. So to his surprise, the rounded numbers, once he ran them through his model, it produced significantly different weather patterns over time than the other case. So this was a very tiny change in the initial conditions, just some decimal points, and it led to a completely different outcome. So it demonstrates the sensitive dependence on the initial conditions that are the heart of the butterfly effect. So there you have it. That's really the big picture of the science of the butterfly effect from weather patterns to extinction events. We see how this concept can play out in the real world. The next time you see a butterfly flapping its wings, I want you to remember that there's a very, very small, but not entirely zero percent chance probability that it will spawn a tornado somewhere down the line. So again, I'm Jason. Thanks for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. I'd like you to please leave me a comment, drop me a line. Let me know, do you like these topics? Did you like what we were talking about here today? Give me some ideas for future topics. I always read every single comment. I really appreciate your time. And I want you, as you walk down the street and you notice a butterfly, always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.